Good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord. Those of you joining us online, good morning to you also. Romans chapter 9 this morning. And if I don't fool around, we can get through the whole chapter, the rest of the chapter. <clears throat> we will stand and read verses 30 to 32. So if you have your Bibles, please stand for the reading of God's word. Romans chapter 9, verse 30. To 32. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone. Please be seated. I stopped short of quoting Isaiah for time purposes. And that's what Paul is going to do to make his point. The ruler of mercy. Ruler of mercy is the name of this morning's message. And I know many of you have mentioned to me how much you like Paul's letter to the Romans. And you also know that it's not high up on my list as books of the Bible go. There are other books that I'm more attracted to. However, it was brought to my attention by the Lord that many years ago, when my mom was nearing the end of her days, that I wanted to make sure, of course impressed upon my heart by the Lord, that her salvation was intact. And I decided, led by the Lord, to read scripture to her. And the Lord reminded me it was the letter to the Romans. And I would read, I read the whole letter to her, and I would stop periodically and say, Mom, do you believe that? And so it is just, a, you know, it really doesn't matter what your opinions are. As far as what, you know, I say I'm Paul, I'm a Apollos. It's all the Lord, every bit of it. And I was just really uh, delighted that the Lord reminded me of that. Well, uh, that just goes to say how powerful a document this is. And in many ways, it brings us the gospel from a direction the gospels themselves don't give to us. That's not an insult at all. That is a, 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 just the Holy Spirit doing what he does best. Looking at the 14th verse, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. Well, he's anticipating objections to his previous statement in the 13th verse. Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. And he's giving that in the context of God's prerogatives to judge and to show mercy. He knew that there would be those and were those assailing his doctrine. Saying, well, you know, Paul... He, he has a doctrine of unfairness. He has a doctrine that allows Gentiles in and damns those that have the scriptures. He knew this stuff was going on. Towards the end of this letter, uh, we, it makes it very clear that he has the Jews in mind in this particular ninth chapter as we know it. So Paul rules out Yahweh's violating his own sense of justice, that's how this verse starts off. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Of course not. God is righteous through and through. If you've got a problem with God, you have the problem. And it, it, the flesh, of course, will, you know, we will come to those places in life where we struggle. We ask God questions and we don't get answers. We have to oftentimes live through the things that have come our way. But he does not abandon us. God did not choose Jacob over Esau without reason. He did choose Jacob over Esau. He chose Israel over the nations. And he has his reasons and he makes them known to us. They're in the scriptures. Nor does, did he call the Gentiles now at this point in history to salvation. Uh, that's the connection that he's making. Well, now it's time for God to call in the Gentiles. He has the right to choose as he did with Jacob and Esau. Incidentally, had God hated Esau and his people, he never would have blessed and protected them, as we read in Joshua 24, verse 4. 
So this went beyond uh, just, um, the, this had to do with what they did with him and their behavior. The descendants of Esau engaged in abominable acts and God saw it coming and he took steps to uh, avoid being associated with the descendants of Esau. God is righteous and sovereign. And Paul backs up this statement with a barrage of scripture verses from their Bible. Exodus 19, Isaiah 1, Isaiah 10, Isaiah 29, Isaiah 45, Isaiah 64, Jeremiah 18, Hosea 1, and Hosea 6. So when you see me quoting verses and cross-referencing scriptures, well, you see where the pattern comes from. What does it matter if we have an opinion and it can't match the scripture? Verses to uphold our doctrine. And in this case, God's sovereign rights to choose to show mercy or not, which would be judgment. In his sovereignty, God is just. He is rational. He is loving. He's gracious. And he's merciful. And now he's embracing the Gentiles on the grounds of faith, not ritual. And he's doing it out loud. And the Jews are having a big problem with this. Not all of them, but many of them are really struggling with this. So verse, and Paul, that's what he's dealing with. Had Paul given up on the Jews, he wouldn't even be having this. We wouldn't have the 9th, 10th, and 11th chapter of Romans. In verse 15, he, to go ahead and develop his point, he says, For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion, verse 16. So then it is not of him who wills nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. Now, if you're not, you know, really digging into the scriptures, that may sound harsh. It may sound subjective. And it's not. He's quoting Exodus 33, verse 19. That's, the, that's that section of scripture where the Jews violated the second commandment. And they shaped a, 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 you know, a, a golden calf. And they said, this is your God who brought you out of Egypt. This is your Yahweh. And Moses, of course, is on the mountain at the time. The people were down below partying over this golden calf. And God sent him down to deal with it. An interesting note about Joshua, the man who succeeded Moses, is that when Moses threw down the law and broke the tablets in wrath, Joshua witnessed it. And, uh, you know, that's just in the, part of his learning experience. And that's just a side note. It really doesn't have much to do with what we're talking about, but it's attractive to me because it's a very human side of our faith. It contributed to Joshua being the man that he was. And as the more you read Scripture, the more you pick these things up, and the more you pick them up, the more you can apply them become usable, more usable to God. So in Exodus, both Israel and Pharaoh, zooming in on these two characters, rebelled against God. Both were subject to God's judgment. And that's what Paul is going with all of this. God would have been right to punish both of them, both Pharaoh for the persecution of God's people and his obnoxious, defiance against God in the face of astounding proofs. And he could have judged Israel for their breaking of the second commandment and so many other things they were doing wrong also. And yet, God is righteous and he granted mercy to Israel, but judgment to Pharaoh. And for a reason. A simultaneous display of God's mercy and judgment in these two characters in this one book. And, and Paul is going there. He's going to be quoting these sections of scripture to make his point about God rules mercy. And it is not random. Nothing is random with God. He is that great and awesome to be able to calculate everything. Nothing gets past him. And this is evidence, this <clears throat> mercy and judgment in the death and resurrection of Christ. The judgment was on, uh, was the crucifixion. 
The resurrection speaks of our salvation and the mercy of God. Notice that he does not give this in the negative. I will have mercy on whom I will have, or compassion on whom I will have compassion. He does not say, I will condemn whoever I will condemn. It does matter how, you, how we see our role as Christians. James and John, the brothers, disciples of Christ, shall we call fire down on them, Lord, for rejecting you? They had to be corrected. That's not how we do business, Jesus said. That's not the spirit. That's the flesh. We're looking to save people. We're not looking to condemn them. Now, that does not mean we excuse sin or we dismiss the judgment of hell. It does mean we are rooting for those who are lost if by any means we can share the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is a mindset. And once you become legalistic, you can become very smug and drastically reduce your usefulness to the Lord. Mercy is an attitude of God. It is an attribute of God. Ezekiel said it this way, God speaking to him, but Ezekiel records it. You shall know that I have done nothing without cause, that I have done, says the Lord Yahweh. I do things because I've thought them through. I know them all. Well, he hasn't thought them through as anthropomorphic, I mean, from our sense, but God just knows. So Romans 9, the punchline of Romans 9 is that God saves whoever accepts him on his terms, Jew or Gentile. This is where Paul is going. Paul is saying, don't hand me this stuff about you've got Bibles. And you're supposed to be all that because you have Bibles. You are supposed to be, but you failed to be. We can say that to many Christians today. Revelation 22, 17, and the spirit and the bride say, come. Now, when you're in the book of Revelation, you notice all the times that the angels spoke with a thunderous voice, with a loud shout. I think we have every reason to believe that this is said out loud with the exclamations in Revelation 22, 17. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts, come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. That's eternal life. This is in operation right now in the dispensation of the church. <clears throat> and it will continue into the great tribulation period. And it is one of the most glorious things about our faith. That God is no respect of persons. Anybody can come who will receive him. Because he rules over mercy. He knows what he's doing. And when God was judging the Jews for their uh, breaking of the commandment, Moses pleaded with God not to wipe them out. And God did not. And the, but there was a judgment. There was a judgment that day. And the Levites sided with God. And they executed his will. But the nation survived. And that was the mercy of God. And he rules over it. God is ruler of mercy. Not Moses. Not man. We have free will. But our willpower will not get us into heaven. It is receiving what God has said. And it is, it is that simple. And anybody who's it, complicating it, I think it's making a serious mistake and missing out on the beauty of the simplicity of our faith as is handed down to us in the book of Acts. And so uh, God reminded Moses, I'm sparing the people, Moses, because I am merciful. Not because you're more merciful than me. Verse 17, he continues, Paul does, because this all started in verse 1 with the Jews. For, hey, what about us with the Bible? And how can the Gentiles come in without Bibles? Uh, this doesn't, it's not fair. This is what he's dealing with, verse 17. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Well... He's quoting Exodus 9, 16, uh, Paul is, again, part of that barrage of scripture to back up his doctrine, as we should have. Pharaoh is an example of willful opposition to God. 
And so where he says, of course, in the beginning of verse 17, for the scripture says, there's, there's where Paul goes for his authority. He then says, for this very purpose, I have raised you up, raised Pharaoh, uh, that is tolerated him, that is used him, and then finally judged him. And those three things, God allowed Pharaoh, God did not just simply choke Pharaoh out. He gave him opportunity. He gave him ten clear opportunities to repent. He came that close, and he ends up dead on the seashores of Yam Suf, the Sea of Reeds. That's where his obnoxious defiance towards God took him. He was not created for destruction, but allowed to be an example of destruction. Pharaoh's choices handed God all the resources he needed to make Pharaoh a poster boy for the ages to come on what a hard heart looks like. God uses those who hand him the resources for either good or evil. For example, in the negative, God uses Satan for his purposes, but God did not make Lucifer a devil. God causes no sin. I'll come back to that statement about God not making him a devil in a moment. But one of the stellar things about Job is that he did not charge God with wrong. Because God does not cause sin. He may allow it. He does allow it. And he also uses it. But he does not engineer it. Job chapter 1, in all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. And if you were to say, well, God caused the sin, then you're charging him with the wrong. When God saves, it is a sovereign act of mercy, which no enemy can block. Somebody coming to Christ, Satan can't stop them. It's, it, 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 you know, that's between God and them at that point, a shield around them. He will try and that person can succumb, but it will not be something that you can blame God for. God gives enough rope for people to either hang themselves or pull themselves out with his assistance. Because we can't save ourselves. It's not possible. But we can allow God to save us or not. And Pharaoh refused to let God be God. He decided everything he saw was not worthy of counting as valuable. Eventually, God will not interfere with man's resistance, which is the story of Balaam, which is the story of Judas. God began by interfering with Balaam's wayward way, getting in the way of him using a donkey to say, Balaam, what are you doing? He did it anyway. And then, of course, God used the treachery to his glory of Judas Iscariot. Jesus could have went right out to the, to the mob and just said, oh, here I am, go ahead, arrest me. He did not. He let it play out. He let Judas become the traitor that he was. Judas handed him the resources, fulfilling the prophecies, giving Judas again, as you've heard me quote often, a chance right up to the end by calling him friend. So God turns over people to the resources of their choosing. Romans 1, even as they did not retain God in their knowledge, there would be your atheists. God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. God says, fine, this is how he hardens the soul. He backs off. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth because they had pleasure in unrighteousness. That's Pharaoh. That's Balaam. And that's just a few scriptures because there are many more that say the same thing in the Old and New Testament. And now we come to verse 19. Again, you have to see this ninth chapter in, the, in its overview uh, format that Paul is answering why Gentiles are now coming in and Jews are now going away from God. That's where they were in, in history at this time, and largely we are there still. Verse, verse 18, Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills to he hardens. 
Now we get, you know, we think that you know, there are those that will blame God for people going to hell. That to me is something to preclude, to rule out of your thinking. That is not what the scripture said. I could not have read Revelation twenty two seventeen. Whomsoever wills, let him come. How can I come if I've been damned? Well, if everyone is saved, then God is not holy and he is not just. Universalism teaches that, oh, he's going to save anybody. Well, then where's the justice? You know, people getting away with evil, not repenting, remaining evil still, and they get rewarded? That's not just. We cry out, there's no justice. And rightfully so. If, on the other hand, none are saved, then God is not loving. And God is not merciful. But he is just. And he is loving and merciful. And he does invite and he does damn. And those situations where you don't have an answer for it, remember that you don't have the answer for it. Don't fill in the blank and think you're going to get that one right. Default to shall not the God of all the earth do right. He will. What Paul is saying is election is by faith. That is the solution. And Pharaoh had his chance, as did Balaam, as did Judas, as did any criminal in Scripture that I can think of at the moment. I have to put that disclaimer there, unless you get me later. And I hate being wrong. God had mercy. Here's an example of that election and that rejection. God had mercy on Rahab. But Balaam's mercy ran out because of Balaam. And we know why. And so the people of God slew him on the battlefield. And whom he wills, he hardens. Again, how? By leaving them as they insist on being left. I don't want to hear your gospel anymore, Mr. Christian. I don't believe it. I don't want it. Leave me alone. That's what the demon said. What do we have to, you, to do with you, Jesus? As he was delivering a man from his handicapped condition. The sun can melt ice or it can harden clay. Which heart have you? Have you a heart that is just hardened against God? Or have you had one that has confessed its sins and has melted in his presence and you're not resisting because we're talking about a hard heart. Through Ezekiel, God promises to give his people a heart of flesh and not of stone. Pharaoh, upon witnessing the actions of Moses' rod, swallowing up his mu magician. I almost said musicians, but they could have been musicians who were magicians. When Pharaoh witnessed that, and he could have repented. He could have said, wow, now that is the God I want to serve, and he did not. Depraved he was, but not totally. Otherwise, there'd be no need to harden his heart. If he was totally depraved, he would have just, there would have been no chance for him. But God, again, hardened his heart by simply withdrawing himself, as insisted upon. Now, Paul did not insist on God withdrawing from him as he was persecuting Christians and the Lord came after Paul and confronted him. Paul did not harden his heart. That heart melted in the presence of the Lord. What would have happened if Paul said, no, I don't want to hear it. These people are violating Moses' law. Then he too would have been like Pharaoh. God does not create man in order to destroy them. God did not make Pharaoh wicked, and he did not make him stubborn, but he used those two things. Those were the resources, some of the resources handed to God. God punished him for his defiance, allowing Pharaoh's evil nature to drive him to death, as I mentioned. Pharaoh now makes a fit example of those who refuse God's mercy and therefore, by default, subject themselves to his ultimate justice. And that's why we put so much energy into praying for lost souls, into preaching for lost souls, into having a church where people can come in and say, well, I could tell you this, there's no weirdness going on. You get the word and you get to go home. 
and you get to go home with whatever the Holy Spirit put on your heart, and you get to do something with it. That now is between you and God. So, taking full responsibility for allowing a man to become what a man chooses to be, that's God. God says, you want to blame me for something? Blame me for letting people be what they insist on being. Do not blame me with jamming the gospel down their throat. I stand at the door and I knock. And do not blame me for sin. Which, which they were going to launch at Paul had he not given this defense. They were accusing him of these things. And so let's get to some of the verse 19. You will say to me, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? Are you kidding me? Paul knows they're going to ask this kind of question. He's been through this since the letter to the Galatians. Revelation comes, I mean, Romans comes much later. He's been around the block quite a few times with this. And now he's putting it in print. And remember, his point is God's sovereignty, not man's salvation. He's really not, he's, I mean, that's part of it, but that's not the primary. He's saying God has a right to bring these Gentiles in and not make them Jews. That's the whole argument. Scripture or no scripture in your background, this is what's going on. So he anticipates their silly objection. As though no one has ever resisted God's will. I mean, oh, come on. You're holding, the prophets are full of rebukes toward the people who've resisted the will of God. So you say, well, where does this happen in, in real, real life? Well, if you've ever watched some of these campus debates with the students, you're shocked. at the, Their ignorance is so deep that it has morphed into evil. It is not just, oh, you poor thing, you don't know up from down. It has now become evil because of what they're doing with their ignorance. They stand by their points with nothing to back it up. And once they are flayed in the debate, they remain obstinate. So we shouldn't be surprised that there are people that will ask sneaky questions like that. Well, who's, you know, where they're trying to go with this is trying to destroy Paul's teaching that God has the rights and the Gentiles now do also. Cannot stress that enough. This is a stumbling block. One of them. They stumbled over who Christ is. Now they're stumbling over how Christ saves souls. And so he sees their bogus challenge coming. Uh, all, how about all the Herods? They resisted God's will. Murdering the babies of Bethlehem. Beheading John the Baptist pushing Christ towards the cross. The evidence was everywhere. And scripture, of course, affirms God's divine sovereignty and man's responsibility at the same time. And that's where also Paul is going. This is this interesting story about King Abimelech. I was talking to another pastor this week and we were talking about this. Um, we we're talking about integrity. And he brought up Abimelech in this section of scripture. And he was pretty, pretty, uh, he was doing pretty good. And I'm saying to myself, you must have just taught on that. But I didn't want to ask him because we had other parts of the conversation to go. But as I went back to prep, this kept coming back to my head. I love this story. This is a story where Abraham, he goes to Gera, a, a place uh, in, between Cadus and Shira. And uh, he's afraid they're going to steal his wife, Sarah. He says, listen. Once they take one look at you, they're going to kill me to get you. So tell them you're my sister, which is a half-truth. He could see it in their eyes, and it was part of the culture back then. Well, they get to Gera, and the king confiscates Sarah, just to get to the point. But God does not let the sin take place, and he confronts Abimelech, the king. And we pick it up in Genesis 20, and Abimelech is... In dialogue with God. Now, this is a pagan king. And he's in a dialogue in a dream. But Abimelech had, uh, verse 4 of Genesis 20, but Abimelech had not come near her. And he said, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation also? Because God was putting judgment on them. And he's confronting him. And I can't read it all, but we'll get to the good part. Did he not say to me, she is my sister? And she even herself said, he is my brother. 
And there's the part. In the integrity of my heart and innocence of my hands, I have not done this. So he's saying, I'm not sinning. I didn't commit anything wrong. I'm in a bad city. I was framed. <laughs> it's kind of a thing. There's the responsibility of man. He was acting upon supposed innocence. But God then replies. And God said to him in a dream, yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart. For I also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Then he goes back to Abraham. Abraham, you made a mess here. Go pray for him. <laughs> I guess you don't see the, 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 the irony of the whole thing. The man that created the mess had to still pastor. And it's the, oh, I don't want to be in that spot. And the man that could have blamed the pastor had to submit so many lessons in the scripture about how God does business. Anyway, the, the responsibility of man... And of course, the sovereignty of God. They go hand in hand. Verse 20. But indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? And he is chopping them down. He is saying to them, who are you to set terms for God? Blocking the Gentiles because you want them to have Sabbath days and, and circumcision and not eat things. Who are you? To interfere with the prophecies that have said this was coming. That's how he's dealing with them. You don't dictate the terms. To contradict God. Here it says, who reply against God in the New King James Version. In the Greek, it's a single word. And it means contradict. It's not just talk back to God. There's nothing wrong with talking back. But to contradict him is a problem. You can ask God questions. He invites us. Come, let us reason. Though your sins are red as scarlet, I will make them white as snow. Peter, he decided he was going to contradict Christ. All these might forsake you. I'm not going to forsake you. And you're not going to the cross either. And what did Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. You're not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. That is a defiant question uh, or reply. Uh, but that's, and so Paul is, is saying to them, who are you to contradict God? And that's the scriptures coming in. So Jesus says, ask, seek, knock, and it will be open to you. The invitation is there. When Paul was converted, who are you, Lord? What do you want me to do? So of course we can ask questions. But don't hold your breath on waiting for the answer. I've learned that. Sometimes, God, well, you'll find out. So will the thing form say to him who formed it? Why have you made me like this? Because if you can say that, then it's God's fault. You made me like this. Don't go blaming me. What if the king had said, Abimelech, well, you made me this way. So it's not the place of the created thing to hand off the blame to the creator. And uh, the opposite is actually true. Ezekiel 28, verse 14 Concerning Satan, I said I'd get back to Satan. Well, here we are. This is what God says of Satan. You were created, well, let me back up. You were anointed, the cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. And he continues to develop that. And yet he becomes the devil. But God says, when I made you, I made you beautiful, and I, I established you. You say that in Judas Iscariot. Jesus established him, sent him out to do miracles and to preach the gospel, to preach the kingdom. And yet, what did he do with it? James said, let no one say, when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. God does not inject the evil, but he uses Satan and the way he uses Satan, <clears throat> by not writing a script for him, but controlling the script that Satan writes. No villain can blame God for being a villain. Psalm 139, verse 14, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That's the Christian view. Not, you know, I will blame you because you made me this way. The matter is one of sovereignty which they were resisting, 
and why, again, they did not heed their own scriptures and found themselves on the outside looking in. And that's what Jesus said. When you see the righteous in the kingdom and you yourselves left out, it'll be your doing. Verse 21. Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? Now, let's stay consistent with the metaphor of the potter. Uh, the clay has to respond to the potter. The metaphor is from Isaiah, twice in Isaiah and once in Jeremiah 18, which is one of the most beautiful passages of Scripture concerning God's care. And God's saying to Jeremiah, you see all this judgment coming? You see all this evil around you? I'm not twiddling my thumbs. I'm still doing stuff. That's the point of Jeremiah 18, one of the main points. Anyway, had this metaphor been applied to a loveless God, then we are left with a different God and a different Bible. But this metaphor is applied to a loving and merciful and sovereign God, and his love is not unjust because love is not unjust. First Corinthians 13, speaking of love, he says, it does not behave rudely, thinks no evil. We have no right to say, well, that is beautiful, and I accept that. I'm going to try not to behave rudely or think no evil. But God can be rude, and God can be, no, he can't. We're, that would be a double standard, and that's not the truth. The truth is that God does not behave rudely. And he thinks no evil. He is aware of it. He knows all about it. <clears throat> but he does not concoct it. It says here, from the same lump of clay. So the metaphor is saying that we're created with, the equal, with equal ingredients. Not talents, but we're made in the image of God, albeit a fallen image at this point in humanity. To make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor. Now, it does not say that God determined the vessel's honor or dishonorability. He's made the vessel. What you do with that vessel afterward, who is that up to? Well, if the potter decides to keep it, the vessel, then it's up to him. But if he sells the pottery, which he's going to do, then it's up to the possessor. What are you going to do with that? Are you going to make it a, a, a bowl for salad or a spittoon? Honor or dishonorable? He's, he's, putting, he's saying God is in control of the whole thing. That uh, the honor or dishonor remains up to the one in possession of the vessels. Second Corinthians, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power of God may not be of us. Why not? Because we're vessels filled with the Holy Spirit versus those not filled with the Holy Spirit, such as... Caesar, uh, Caesar Nero. Nero wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit. He's filled with the evil spirit. Christ made quick work of the unclean spirits that had filled the lives of so many people around him. What we allow God to do with us makes a difference between honor and dishonor. And that's what we read in 2 Timothy 2. But in a great house, that is, you can say the church, there are... Not only vessels of gold and silver. I'm gold. I just want to claim it for anybody else. Okay, that was six-year-oldish of me. But the vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood, clay. Some for honor. Some for dishonor. But it doesn't say how they get there. Well, we know how they get there. The scripture does say. The honorable vessels are metaphor applied to those seeking the filling of the Lord. The dishonorable are disinterested in God's filling. Luke chapter 5 verse 38. But the new wine must be put into new wineskins. And both will be preserved. What do you put in them? How do you do it? God could not pour into Pharaoh honorable things. Instead, Pharaoh poured out from his own self dishonorable things called persecution. Korah and his dunce colleagues, Dathan and Abiram and On, they rebelled against Moses in Numbers 16. God didn't pour that into them. God is pouring into the Gentiles his prophetic work. 
Will these Jews allow it? Many of them did. Barnabas did. Silas did. Verse 22. What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long-suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction and that he might make... And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory. Well, that's exactly what happened between Pharaoh and Moses. What if wanting to show his wrath? God wanted to show his wrath. He took the opportunity. Okay, Pharaoh, you're going to be that way. I knew you were going to be that way. And you're going to get the wrath. And that's why they perished when the sea closed up around them after letting God's people pass through. So Paul is making a point and not establishing a doctrine. He injects a hypothetical here. Uh, again, anticipating their objections. Uh, he's anticipating that the Christian, Jewish Christians in Rome will read the Roman letter that's all about salvation in those first eight chapters. And when they're in discussion with their unsaved Jewish brethren, these arguments are going to come up. And so he is heading them off at the pass. What this is not saying is that God picked who he wanted to damn. That is not what this is saying. But the hypothetical is, well, what if? If God wanted to demonstrate his mercy and his goodness. Remember, were it not for the fallen Eden, the angels would have never gotten to see what God's Self-sacrificing love is all about. Who else has he died for on a cross? When the angels rebelled, he just booted out the rebels and he retained the angels that remained righteous. It was not until Calvary did the angels say, wow. He became a man, suffered all sorts of things like a man, and then let him kill him in a very nasty way. God made his glory known. So it's not a new thing. And there are other places where it exists also. He has reason and he has made it known. And here it is in Luke 13. I tell you, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. There's the key. Repentance. You want to, you want to be elected into the kingdom? Repent. For the kingdom of God is drawn near. Now, one other thing about this metaphor, potters don't make pottery just to slam it on the ground. They sell it to people who want to take the pottery out to the range and shoot it up. But they themselves they won't do that. And so, uh, but they retain the right. Verse 22, wanting to show his raft to make known his power. And I've already mentioned Pharaoh and Balaam, and I think, we have covered that. Uh, I read Psalm 81, verse 12. So I gave them over to their own stubborn heart to walk in their own counsels. That pretty much answers the, the hypothetical question Paul is giving us. God endured, he says, with much long suffering, the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Well, he endured. How many times did Moses and Aaron have to go back to Pharaoh? Well, 10 incidences, but it covered a period of time, a long period of time. Well, God was enduring, endured with much suffering, the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Those determined to reject God have prepared themselves for wrath. They are therefore predestined for wrath. They have done it. They got on that flight. God did not shove them into the plane going to hell. God did not make them such vessels. Acts 17, verse 30. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Well, what about all those in between? None of your business. And if it were, God would have told us. But we understand. He'll do right. I'm not worried about it. What did Mary said to Jesus? Listen to him. I can't tell you all the details about what he's going to do with our lack of wine. But I know he's going to do something. And whatever it is, it's going to be remarkable. And I've sent you to him. Now I'm out of here. And it was just a remarkable moment in history. When Jesus says, woman, what do you want from me? And it was a, it was a signal saying, you know, you, 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 
I'm much more than your son, according to the flesh. That's what was in his address to her. Instead of saying, Mom, <laughs> even as a grown man, I go, Mom, come on. But <clears throat> things change there with him. So an affliction in hell. This is an affliction of hell. That those in hell will all be irrelevant. What an affliction that will be. Can you imagine in this life, there are people who end their lives because they have, feel so, such an irrelevance. And, you know, that's the, God is the antidote to that. You're not irrelevant. I died for you. You mean something to me. Yeah, you might be at the bottom of the barrel right now, but you're still just as valuable to me now as you ever were. God moves on to eternity with or without people. Potters make the vessel, then it is up to the one who takes possession of that vessel to decide what to fill it with. A Gentile can receive Messiah poured into them. Acts chapter 10, verse 45 and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. They became vessels of honor. So just as Paul uses all of his verses to make his points, I'm using all these other verses to make points about his points. God is vocal about desiring mercy. Matthew 9, verse 13. Here in Hosea 6, where he's quoting, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, but the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. And Samuel makes a similar statement. But that's obedience. Anyway, which he prepared beforehand for glory. So God prepared the salvation for those who, again, would receive and not for those. Well, what part of that is not make, does not make sense? When you tell somebody, listen, he's God Almighty. He dictates the terms. Why are you having a hard time with these terms? And it, that's what Pharaoh, Moses essentially was saying. You know, Moses, his, Moses and Aaron walking back from doing these incredible signs in front of Pharaoh, saying to each other, can you believe how thick-headed that guy is? How does a guy like him get on the throne? I mean, he's as dumb as all dirt. Just like, well, my favorite Looney Tunes statement, dumb as a sack of hammers or wet mice. All right, I guess he's just like, he's like come on, Pastor, let's go. <laughs> Verse 24, even for us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. That's a thorn in, thorn in their side. You and I just read that very casually. That grated on them like, there he is again with these Gentiles. Remember, we talked about the hatred that they had for Gentiles coming in without becoming Jews. Christ, they, I mean, it was so against him, the hatred. In the first three chapters of Mark, he delivers three people from three different ailments. One was a paralytic, one was demon-possessed, and the other had a handicap. And by the third time, they plotted how they were going to kill him for this because he dared do it on the Sabbath. Are these people out of their minds? Yes. Yes. And didn't make any excuses for them. Liberalism is a curable disease. But you've got to come to God. <laughs> and liberalism has become synonymous with demonism. Let's kill babies. Let's perverse uh, as many sexual things as we can. I mean, this just doesn't stop. Well, verse 25. And he says, and we'll pick it up. There's a lot of speed here in a minute. We're going to make it actually through this if I shut up and start getting back to it. And he says, uh, he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people who were not my people and her beloved who was not beloved. Verse 26. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people. They shall be called the sons of the living God. Now, he's, he's just telling these boys, I know scripture like you do. You want to have a you know, scripture contest? Okay, well, here, here you go. Hosea said this. Now, Hosea was talking about the people of God being strengthened. Paul expands it and says there's an incident of, of God in the scripture. And there are other ones where he makes a place for them, and they will be sons of the living God. No Gentile nation was ever called a people of God. But 
the Gentiles as individuals are grafted in to being the people of God and are now on equal footing with the Jews as individuals go. So the precedence for God rejecting unrighteous Israel is there. They shouldn't be surprised. He's saying, yeah, God's going to take in these Gentiles. Wicked Jews have been rejected before, and they're going to be rejected now. You don't get a pass because you're a Jewish. And he's already covered this. But he now, again, he's, he's answering their objections. Verse 27, Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. And there's the passion of Paul for his people. Verse 28, for he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness because Yahweh will make a short work upon the earth. Of course, that's the coming of Christ. Verse 29, and Isaiah said before, unless Yahweh of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom, we would have been made like Gomorrah. So he's appealing to them. He said, look, don't, don't make them. God is looking to save his people. He's not looking to judge and damn them, but they will be damned if they insist. He's already made quick work of Sodom and Gomorrah, and he'll do it of anybody else. So he's quoting Isaiah chapter 10. Now, Sabaoth is an untranslated Hebrew word. Instead of saying, uh, unless the Lord of hosts or multitudes, he uses the Jewish word, untranslated, which means, just tells us, he has the Jewish audience now in mind. He's zeroing in on his Jewish his countrymen, and the Gentiles really are sort of like not a big part of what he's going after. They, it still affects them, because there were Jews that would still come up to them and try to get them to be Jewish first. And so he's shown that Jew, the, the Jewish history has a record of unfaithfulness, and God has not annihilated them, and he's not going to annihilate them, and he'll get that, and we'll get that in the chapters to come. So as we've been in the first eight chapters, it's been about soul saving. These three chapters, it's about Israel and the dynamic between the Gentiles and Jews in the church. Uh, and so if you know that, I think it all becomes a little bit more clearer. Uh, you, everything I've taught this morning has an anti-teacher out there that uh, has a different view and uh, is their right to be wrong. And uh, I'm, I'm, you know, just that's the way it is. You need to come to your conclusions based on what I said. <laughs> Verse 30. Uh, so when we laugh, I think you can put a little bit more gut into it. <laughs> anyway, verse 30. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. I've been driving that home all morning, all chapter 9. Then he answers it, and we referenced this in earlier sessions. Why? Why is this so? Verse 32. Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone. They still thought Messiah Christ could be ignored so long as we keep our Sabbaths and our diets and our other rules. We're fine. And he is telling them, you're not. You have actually made your ritual more important than the righteous Messiah. And we watch that unfold in the Gospels. Verse 33, as it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense. And whoever believes on him shall not be put to shame, whether you're Jew or not. And I told you the cross is a, is a stumble, is, a, is an offense to many. And there Paul is saying it, quoting Isaiah, applying it properly to Christ. So he sums it up with this. And you don't blame the scripture. Israel stumbled over grace. They wanted a militant Messiah. They wanted a lion-like Messiah. God gave them the lamb, not a lamb, the lamb. They wanted a throne. And God gave them the cross, the cross of Christ. So we close with this verse out of Galatians. <clears throat> I see you've gone a little long this morning. Galatians 4.21, tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you hear the law? 
You have you who have Bibles. Do you hear what it's saying? Are you heeding it? Are you taking the time to get to the bottom of it? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, um, should Lord thank you because you you uh, sort of push us to dig into your word and not take it for granted. There are surface meanings that are very powerful, but there are some deeper ones too. We need them both. May you keep in us an appetite to get to the bottom of as much of your word as we can, to not run away from the hard sections and to not take them for granted. And when something doesn't make sense, may we put some effort into trying to resolve it. We thank you for occupying our time like this. If you've been listening or if you are here in the church or watching online, listening online, and you've not trusted your eternal salvation with Jesus Christ, you are destined for a judgment that will not go well for you at all. There aren't words to tell you how awful it will be. Rather than concentrating on missing out on heaven, let's concentrate on getting into it. It's a simple step. It won't cost you anything because the price has already been paid in blood by Christ. If you would like to trust Jesus Christ as the one who is to lord over your life, as the Son of God, and the Savior of your soul, who does not deserve to go into heaven, but would be very welcomed there, then you've got to come to him. Unless you repent, you will perish. And repentance means you admit that you break God's laws. It only takes one, it only takes one time to make a sinner. If you say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner, and I ask you to forgive me. There's no one else who is worthy. There is no one else who loves me as much as you. And I give my life to you right here, right now. I trust my entire future to you. And I ask that you would be not only the Savior of my soul, but the Lord over my life from this day forward. And now, Father, if anyone has made this prayer this morning, may they not be ashamed to step forward at the end of the service and share it with one of the pastors. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.